Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to have you here, all, all four of you. Shimon, thanks a lot for joining me. I'm very pleased you are here. I'll finally have uh, the chance to ask all the questions I should have probably asked during the due diligence. And as I told you, primarily, uh, you saved me from preparing uh, the presentation. So it's double benefit today. I'm getting really nervous about that. <laughs> Technical changes. Does this one work? Yeah, cool. So before we jump in uh, to uh, today's interview about ups and downs or of running a startup. Would you like to introduce yourself and contact briefly? We might scream without microphone. <laughs> One, two, three. Okay, guys. Ah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here with you and also share some of our knowledge and, and, and some of our ideas around uh, doing, building startups. Um, myself, uh, I'm a co-founder and, and CEO at Contact.io. Contact.io is uh, the global leader in, in Beacon Space, uh, ranked by ABI Research last year. We are number one in terms of uh, Beacon infrastructure. Uh, deployed globally. Um, sort of beacons are the new technology that is giving the physical uh, world a new context that you can use with your mobile phones. Uh, sort of a technology that is uh, hidden uh, but delivers a lot of value for your smartphone apps uh, and also web, mobile web uh, in particular. Uh, kind of a changing the way uh, the future looks in terms of IoT, in terms of uh, contextual computing with smartphone. Cool. So uh, sounds like sophisticated company, which you started. So did, you, did, did, did you? It's good. good. OK. <laughs> so uh, if you could uh, go back to the moment when you started the company, how did it happen? So uh, you went out of school and decided I'm going to become an entrepreneur or was it rather a coincidence? Yeah, it's a good question. I've been always doing some stuff. Uh, I've been always doing um, projects in IT, trying to uh, technically make some money just to support my education, uh, just to support my needs or stupid ideas like buying the most expensive networking hardware you can find. Um, so these kind of things were always driving me. And um, since I joined my university, I, I was already an entrepreneur to very little extent doing small business. Um, and technically going through the university, doing a couple of different projects. Uh, after that, I have not imagined that I can work for somebody. So I realized I want to start something by my own. And I got, uh, with, with a couple of my friends from the university, uh, we started a software house. And software house uh, that was creating their own tools, their own products. And after two years, uh, I left that startup. And um, I decided that I want to do something, something that is physical, something that has impact. Uh, I didn't know what would that be, but uh, I met my, I mean, my, my banker, uh, Tomek, who is sitting over there. Uh, Tomek was, was my banker and, and he said, hey, how about, uh, you're doing startups, how about you give me like 15 to 20 minutes, I have an idea to talk about. And I was like, yeah, okay. And, um, and we, we met, uh, he brought his friend who's, uh, who's a blind person and they told me that, you know, 300 million people on this planet, they have a problem because they're visually impaired and they cannot navigate in a, in a museum, they cannot navigate in a public place. So I found that really interesting from uh, I would say social impact perspective. And I said, hey, this is what I want to do. And uh, we started working on this technology. We've been looking for ways of doing this. And we found that, okay, 
the smartphone is the device that a blind person knows by heart. So we can deliver the context to that smartphone. And this is how we created the very first device, the very first beacon. But um, sort of, yeah, it, in general, it's this lust that you have in you that you want to do stuff, you want to, you want to break things and, and deliver. So basically, to become an entrepreneur, uh, for you, it wasn't a conscious decision like, I'm building my career, I will do this and that, which will ultimately lead me to become an entrepreneur. It was just that you didn't want to work, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> actually, actually, it's funny because I, I've been always told, uh, so I was very reluctant to do what people tell me and, uh, well, of course, I mean, you know, t people like family or, or people who surround you, uh, you should get a career at, you know, a big company or you should uh, do this or that or, you know, doing startups, this is super risky, you can't afford your food and, and you want to continue like this. It's like, you know, these things are there. If you're, uh, if you're building a startup, it's often that you don't have money. It's often that you live in some, you know, really, really um, terrible place and you, you, you cannot afford your rent or, or food. So I've been there and, and to be honest, this is like, uh, you don't think about it. You, you set it aside and you just want to do it. You just want to build something and you're not thinking about it. Hey, I want to build a startup. No, I want to build this thing because it's, in, you know, it's, it's something that is cool to me. So I think you got to be uh, a geek to some extent mm -hmm. deep down there, not a business person. Because a business person would be say like, you know, this idea, it will not fly. You will not make money on navigation for blind people. Everybody around me were telling me this and I was like, I don't care. I want to solve it. This is too interesting for me just to leave it out there. Okay. So you, you were there, started the campaign. Most of people around you tried to warn you you didn't have the money to pay the rent. Was it the point when you decided to raise external capital or how did you actually come to a decision, yes, I will raise some money? Yeah, with the, with the first startup, it, it was this, you know, sort of a situation where actually, yeah, it was difficult. It was, you know, difficult with money, with everything. Um, once I built this and, and it was at some point uh, an exit for me, I already had money to start another venture, which is contact.io. And in here, it was a little bit different because I invested with my friend our money into the business and then we validated the product. It turned out that everybody wants it globally and we technically became a global company in the first month of opening uh, the pre-orders. So the difference is that we, from that point, it, it took us a year where we were totally bootstrapping. So all the money that was coming in from the orders, we've been building it up and, you know, tooling, uh, ordering the stock, uh, developing further and further and further. Uh, and just after one year, we realized, okay, we are now a team of 18 people and, uh, it's, it's, it's huge, this works. So ju yeah. Just to put it now into some time frame for, for the audience, when was it? So this was, uh, so we started three years ago. Uh, for the first year we bootstrapped, then we took an investment uh, from, from a Danish fund. Yeah. Sandstone Capital, yeah. So, so just uh, so that everybody knows, it was already the time when uh, most of the founders, when they just uh, put down a PowerPoint presentation and starting the company, they already look for the venture capital. Why did yeah. you decide to go a different path? Do you think it paid off for you? Do you see some advantages of that? So to be honest, I only need it because we've been a hardware business, smart hardware business, and, and we, we saw that, okay, we are doing okay, but with investors, we could run much faster. So uh, the motivation was just to get the money and, and, and just to you technically have a higher stock mm -hmm. so you can order more volume and you can discount the prices on, on your cogs. And technically that was the first motivation. And, and, and then I realized that actually having a good VC on board, it can actually help us with you know, defining things, uh, you know, thinking about strategy, thinking about the future. And sort of, uh, it, it was funny because we almost signed the deal then, uh, but I was, just, uh, I was just called by one of the VCs and he said he has to meet me. And we've met and we had this click. You know, that we understood that we think the same way, we value the same things, so it makes a lot of sense to go together. And the money, yeah, that's nice, but then we're going to have a really good cooperation together. Sounds almost like advertising for VCs, so I hope all entrepreneurs listen to that. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I didn't pay him for that, so. <laughs> uh, but seriously, uh, so uh, if you could speak more about how the process went, uh, why did you decide to accept money from Sunstone, if you spoke to anybody else, if you actively were looking for the money or rather were approached. So that's... Just the experience yeah. so that other founders actually yeah. can learn something from that? Definitely there are different layers in this story, but one of the layers is that uh, I was hooked up by this sort of a challenge thing because Max from, from Soundstone, he told me, you know, you are the last company on my list and I have never, never spoke to you and I, and I really need to because we're doing this due diligence on the market. We already talked to everybody and you're the last. I have to talk to you. And I was like, okay. Uh, so now it's <laughs> so it's now it's my challenge to 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 uh, you know be the best. And sort of that was the one thing. Um, and the other thing was uh, you know trying to um, trying to find the right the right people to to meet because we we didn't have that much experience. We didn't have that much you know um, knowledge about the VC world, how it works, and all of this. So having someone who can get you. Uh, by hand through the process and make it simple and sweet. This is this is the best thing that can happen to uh, to a startup at the, at the first stage, I think. So you got this experience. Did you hire some advisors for the process, or you basically so, used no, uh, internet sources to validate that the terms you're getting are okay? How was it? Yeah. So actually, we just hired some. We just hired a lawyer, uh, Titus. Titus, you're here. No, he's not here. But uh, we hired uh, we hired a lawyer to help with the process. But to be honest, I think this is something that is pretty cool with with Western investors, uh, like like Sunstone and yourself, is that you have a certain sort of a quality of uh, approaching deals and, inv and and entrepreneurs. So. You know, in, in Poland, it is it is it differs. So there there's different quality here and there, and different you know terms and everything. Uh, with VCs that are already well structured, there is this integrity, integrity in terms of okay, this is the terms you're gonna get, and probably if you have another VC, you will get very similar terms, and they're all fair. So, so what do you think the difference is there? So I think it's about the experience. Okay, so know? just less history, basically. Yeah. So, so when a Western Western VC approaches you as a startup here in Poland, they're not taking the edge of the. Okay, we know it better. We know all about terms and everything. We might give them a slightly worse deal just because you know these guys don't have the experience. And and to be honest, this is great because uh, they. You know, I don't see Western investors using that here in Poland. Mm -hmm. And opposite, I see a lot of Polish investors trying to use this sort of a money leverage on startups and, and just a little bit handcuff them uh, on wrong terms. I see. Yeah. Seem, seems short-sighted. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, so you had that process which actually convinced you you should take the money from those guys. So has anything, anything changed after you got an external investor or was everything the same as before? I mean, times are never the same, but what has actually changed after you got external capital in your company? It's like, I would say that every round is different because you're learning a lot about the VC world, you're learning about uh, raising money and, um, and the whole setup. And you also keep the relationship building because let's say that you're doing the first round and you meet 50 to 70 investors, right? And, and you know where it clicked. You know that these guys, they're nice, and they understand what I'm doing, and they can help me to create more value. And how do you know? Is it just on the personal level, or it's the most important? Yeah, this is, this is, this is uh, on, on both. This is on personal level, but also on, on the professional level. Mm -hmm. Because for example, if you're meeting a VC and the guy is giving you a lot of feedback on stuff you're doing, and for example, is doing research and then shares the research with you, this is, this is great. Even if you don't do deal, it's like both sides win. Because they learn, we learn, and everybody, everybody leaves the room as a, as a winner, right? And, uh, and, and as you grow and as you're doing next round, you already know these guys. So for them, for you to go to these guys, even if you don't do the deal together, but for example, you go through the pitch deck, you talk to them, and then you adjust 
the story to be more compelling to other investors, it's a win. So I would say with VCs, uh, the thing that changed in my mind, I thought before it is like a bank. You go there, you take a loan, and that's it, right? Maybe there is some, you know, structure like okay they're gonna consult they're gonna uh, bring me some customers or this kind of things or some synergy within their their network but the truth is that this is like building relationship like any other if you go to uh, to your customer you you just can't sell him on the first date you have to build up the relationship the same way with VCs if you really want to make it work you have to think about the round Z you have to think about okay what's gonna happen in, in 30 30 years from now, do I want to have great relationships with these guys or just I want to take the money, build the thing and cash out? Mm -hmm. So right now I'm thinking mostly about how do you make great relationships with the people that you believe uh, that have the same values as you. So this, this really worked for me from attitude perspective. This is something that I strongly also support on hiring people in a, in a startup that you have to have that click. You have to, you know, feel that the attitude is very similar. So do you think there's any sort of advice that people who are starting their own companies at the moment and looking for capital could use? How to actually decide for a VC? Yeah, the, the difficulty there is um, the, the starting point, right? Because usually it is super hard to, to do cold pitches. So for example, uh, you're sending out emails and asking VCs if they, wanna, if they want to see the pitch deck, right? This is always difficult. So I think uh, events like this is a great, great time to meet guys like you and talk to you and try to build a relationship with you. So not pitching me directly. No, I think... Thank you. <laughs> So, so, so truly, truly, you gotta be there. You, you gotta show yourself as a person, not as a, not as a startup, not as your, you know, idea around business. You gotta just, just show the, the person in you, and then start building the relationship. It's like, it's like even with dating, right? You just, you just can't have well, Tinder relationships. Well, maybe, but it's, it, it has to take time. It has to take a, a proper sort of a process. Ah, it takes some time, but we're typically easy to be seduced so <laughs> <laughs> exactly okay uh, so back to contact uh, and if anything changed after you got capital at least one thing certainly changed you got much more money and uh, you invest the money back to the company so how do you actually manage or what changed in terms of what you're doing in the company when you've got more resources available? Is there any such change? So, yeah, this is, this is difficult because there is this paradigm where you actually you have more resources, er, uh, therefore you have to uh, put more uh, attention to how you spend the resources, how do you put them in order. So at one end you can think, okay, this is no longer a startup because we have those uh, cost forms and we have this uh, budgeting and everything. But the truth is that you know, when you have 80 people on board, it is really, really difficult uh, to make sure that you know, every dollar goes in the right way, uh, in the right direction. Everybody's doing something that actually adds up to the company mission. Uh, instead of just you know losing resources, so you know the the sort of difficulty in managing the company this, it grows exponentially. So for me, this is like uh, every quarter, this is a little bit different company from a perspective of we understand now that we're missing a lot of this leadership, this management, this sort of uh, way of doing accounting, and it's like increasingly uh, increasingly building up. So you got to keep up. You got to stretch yourself. Uh, you got to learn those things. Uh, so how do you learn it? Do you have anyone helping you? Yeah, that's, of course. You're hiring smart people. You're hiring people with experience in certain areas that can help you. Especially if you talk about like you know difficult things in Poland, which is accounting and these kind of things. But on the other end, uh, you also have to have this urge. Okay, I know that I can do leadership much better. I know that I can manage this company much better. It's never the level that I can feel comfortable with because that's never the, the thing. But then you are trying to, to find someone to help you. You're finding someone that can uh, teach your leaders management a little bit. 
uh, you find someone who can coach you, you can find someone who will help you and your team to get better at what you're doing. And this is sort of uh, where VC also become handy because these guys mostly they've done stuff. They have built their startups, they have been built their firms and they, they run businesses and they can uh, just with a quick conversation coach you to the extent that you actually are a better manager uh, just another day. So, uh, so it becomes much more actually about managing people than uh, you know, really doing the stuff. Yeah, when we, when we realize, you know, when you start the thing, you think, okay, the company is the product, right? It's like, uh, like Contact.io, it's a beacon company, it's a beacon. But then you realize, no, it's the beacon that was created by people who are in the company. So it goes back and then you realize, actually, the guys you have in the company, and girls, of course, this is the only resource you have. Hmm. The money is to pay their salaries so they, they can afford food. But that's the thing. But, but in general, when you realize that people is your only capital that you have, because everything else is sort of out of the environment that you have influence on, uh, it's like it changes the way how you manage the company. You know, it's like often you're hiring intelligent people and you're not letting them to, to, to work. You're not letting them to do their job. So, uh, of course, it's not like a straight journey. You just hire the brightest people you can find and then just tell them go crazy because they will go crazy. Uh, but the thing is that you just make sure that you can you know, uh, ch channel their experience and channel their uh, uh, emotions and, and hard work into something that brings a lot of value to your customers. And this is sort of the trickiest thing you can find on earth, I think. I see. So, and correct me if I'm wrong, so you have more than 80 people, right? You have the company uh, which is growing in hundreds percent, percent year on year. Uh, you need to think about the strategy, managing all those people. You also have to handle key accounts. How do you manage at the same time to remain married? <laughs> uh, that's 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 a tricky thing. Um, I, I've been thinking about this and you know people say okay there is no work-life balance right and uh, I'm a family guy you're a family guy as well yeah um, I am and admit <laughs> and I realize this is about priorities and um, I think that you know for me for my family is my priority number one ergo I always when I have time I'm spending this with my family and uh, my priority number two is my company so this way I can have a healthy uh, family relationships uh, without sacrificing one another. And often it's like people are putting their, their business as their first priority. And you know, you can do business for 14 or 15 hours a day. There's no time left for the, for the family. And this is, this is what I realized that, um, you know, at the end of the day, the company might be there or not, right? You're interacting with those great people every single day, but the truth is that when you when you go go home, you don't want this to be just an empty room, right? So, <laughs> got to work through that. So much true. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I'm not exactly sure what's the timing about that, but if there's any questions in the audience, I'm happy to accept them. Yeah. No questions, so we're boring. Uh, I can ask you another question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you are from Krakow originally, and uh, you're part of the Krakowian community, if we can call it. Do you think Krakow is somehow special in terms of the startups being built there, or do you overall believe that in the region and in Poland in particular, there are interesting startups being built? Yeah, in general, I, I believe that, that Poland has this really, really good ground for innovation. And this is like, for, this, is, this is of course valid for Krakow, for Warsaw, uh, Wroclaw, or even uh, Gdańsk and, and other places. And the thing is that we have the technical talent that in today's world is the key ingredient to any sort of, any startup, any kind of business, right? And this, 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 uh, this, this capital was, was nurtured years by not only big businesses, but also uh, universities. So 
I think that uh, the, the biggest value that we have as, as a country right now is this technical talent and open-mindedness that you can use uh, and you have to bring in the business skills, the business um, sort of experience to make it a synergy. So generally you're positive that me as a VC, I will still be getting business yeah. out of this region. Yeah, okay. if, if, I, if I can imagine anything else that I'm doing, I would be just looking out there for, for, uh, for great talent and for great startups because they're all there. Okay. Oh, cool. There's a question. I'm so happy we got a question here. <laughs> hey, hey, Shimon. Uh, Patricia from Brainly. Uh, I have a question because I know that you recently opened the office in Berlin. You have also office in New York. I have a question regarding the, uh, the contacts, uh, Brainly uh, culture, or organization culture. So, how you manage to sustain it? in order to be, you know, exactly the same in all those offices. Yeah, thank you, Patricia. That's a, that's a great so, question. Sorry, I have to interrupt. You, you, you even serve yourself. It's so amazing. I can just go away. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is the tricky one, because when you have a startup, uh, you obviously know, OK, I have this great engineering talent in Krakow, but how do I you know, use the, the business talent? Where do I get it, right? And, and you're looking at cities and you see, okay, London, this is too expensive. Uh, you see Berlin, which is nice. And then you think, okay, I'm just gonna kick in the office there and everything gonna go, go, go great from there, that point. And then you realize that, you know, uh, there is something like, uh, that, like culture and it means that people are doing stuff differently or believing in, the people are believing in different things and you have to account your management, uh, account everything for this. So technically, when we started our Berlin office, we already knew that, for example, the key difference is in Berlin, nobody is, I would say, family oriented. These guys started at nine and they work till, till six or seven p.m., right? They don't mind, they love it. And, and in Krakow, it's totally different because, for example, most of the engineers, most of people, they already have families and they're like young families families. So they are like uh, starting at 6 or 7 a.m. just like me and they're ending at, at 4 uh, and, and that's it. And you know when you have a VC visiting over and they, uh, they're staying uh, f f at 4 to 5 in Krakow office and they see the office empty they're like what the hell? Where do I invest my money, right? <laughs> the guys went home. <laughs> so, so this is like uh, the, this is the challenge. How do you, you connect those things? and? You know, Berlin? Berlin is easy because Berlin is very close. So at Contact.io we have technically, well, well we, we bought a shuttle, we bought a bus uh, that is uh, with a driver that is just doing Krakow Berlin two or three times uh, a week and there is no questions asked. You just jump on the bus and it services you door to door. So uh, we wanted to get, get rid of this sort of decision making behind who goes and who's not going and, and, and so on. So it's like anybody can go. An engineer, he wants to spend a week in Berlin, he goes there. We have a nice office, uh, he can stay there and enjoy Berlin and also transfer the culture transfer what we believe in Krakow, what we're doing in Krakow. And the other way around, when he gets back to Krakow, he tells the guys, hey, they're doing this. This is pretty cool. These guys are helping us. Sort of a, these things are tiny. You don't see them at first if you start your, your company. But at some point, this is like uh, the key factor whether this will fly or not. And it goes even more trickier when you have an office like we have right now in Shenzhen, China and also uh, Guadalajara, Mexico, and New York. So this is like super tricky how to get the right culture flowing, how to get this feeling of uh, sort of a one company, one mission thing. This is a uh, so, big challenge. So it's back to the point when you grow to certain uh, size, managing the people and making them happy at work is the crucial point. Uh, that somebody said that the first person he would hire for the company would be an HR manager, I guess. So, wh wh number, wh which number was your hire an HR manager? Oh, that's a good question. I think it was, um, it was number 18 or 20. Okay. Yeah, so Something that's, like that's that. probably the size which where you need someone yes. who is really managing that 
uh, full time more yeah, or less. Yeah, but it's like you, you you have to learn it. If you're if you're uh, if you're the CEO, it's like you have to set up the standard. So it's like because there's it's going to be a totally different person when you hire that person at at I would say at number twenty, and it's going to be a, a totally uh, different person you will need uh, when you have eighty people on board. Mm -hmm. But you can of course stretch that person if you're setting up the right expectations, if you are sort of the guardian of the, the HR in the company. So for example, at Contact IO, I am, uh, I am the last step of every single interview. So I know everybody who is being hired at Contact IO because the last step is meeting with me. So uh, some people say I'm crazy, but uh, to the extent that I really know everybody, I know what's their hobbies, how they are, you know, if they have a family or not, uh, what kind of stuff they like, what's, what kind of stuff they don't like. And the thing is that until I can do this, I think it's my company. Because I know the, I know the guys. And well, the company is the people, so yeah. yeah. Cool. I guess we're already stealing from the next session, right? Should we finish or? Can, uh, I can continue. We've got more questions. So unless we have to go, we have to. One last, one last. I can do it all day long, so. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got one last question. I ran there. <laughs> mm, hi, I'm Dominic. Actually, I've got a question about building a sales team, because uh, I've heard from many people it's like one of the biggest challenges. And if you could elaborate about the step where you actually started from zero to like many sales people, how actually to build a team and like how to monitor, especially if you're going to other cities, other countries, uh, whether you use uh, nowadays uh, your internal system or whether you have any software that you can recommend, how to set KPIs for sales people, etc. Thanks. So another hour here, right? <laughs> this is actually another great, great question because it's like what I noticed is that sometimes, I mean not sometimes, but often startups forget about sales. And they think that they can, you know, set up everything in the internet, uh, set up, you know, nice marketing automation, and then everything will fly and everybody will subscribe to their uh, SaaS business. Uh, well, that's nice, but it, the truth is that you always need a sales team, and this is something I strongly encourage you. If you're building any sort of startup, any any startup, you need to build a sales team right away. Don't wait for it because it's going to be too late and you will realize that you cannot raise money because you have no revenue. And uh, sales team is absolutely the most important part of your, uh, your role as a, as a CEO. Uh, I was very fortunate that I hired uh, a friend from my university that was working at Oracle. Uh, so he was a very structural, he, he is a very structured sales guy who is a killer. And, and, and this guy, he built a whole sales organization. The, the key thing about sales organization in a company like ours, which is uh, smart hardware, is that you really have to have this team to be, to be flexible. It, it's, it's like, uh, of course, they are still selling, but every single quarter, there are, there are tweaks. There are differences. You're doing things differently. And uh, of course, you start easy with having your own Excel file uh, with the orders, and that's it. But then you have to build up your own platform for taking the orders or have a SaaS. Uh, then you have to have something like HubSpot uh, to make sure you have the right flow of the deals. Uh, right now we're using uh, Base. Uh, it's also a Krakow, uh, Krakow tool uh, that are doing great stuff. Uh, and technically, um, you, have to, you have to learn a lot about sales, how to do it, how to measure it, how to restructure it. Uh, you also have to be there with the experience of meeting the, meeting the, the, the customers. So you know what is the, the, what's the, what's the biggest part, what's the biggest value in your proposition. Um, actually, I think that what we did at Contact.io that, that, that helped us to be where we are is technically focusing on the sales. So being there for the customer, making sure that we understand the process, making sure that we understand the data uh, and trends and everything else. So I would say uh, one of the key ingredients for a startup. Okay. So our time is up, so yeah. Shimon, thank you very much for thank joining so me.